What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, and like today's founder, Dan Zawacki, I'm gonna introduce you in a second, but you need to check out past episodes. So this is specifically pertinent to this conversation, Dan. <clears throat> you need to check out past episodes. People should check out past episodes with Gino Wickman. Gino Wickman, if you don't know, is the founder of EOS Worldwide, an organization that's helped over 70,000 companies use and implement EOS tools. He's the author of, you could see some of the books behind Dan if you're watching the video, Traction, Rocket Fuel, Entrepreneur Leap. Um, there's yeah, so cool. many uh, that are amazing and just learning from him has been amazing. Um, also check out my interview with Mark Winters who co-authored Rocket Fuel with Gino Wickman as well, which you can see behind Dan, that, that, you know, what, that book definitely really helped my thinking, Dan, about having someone who's an integrator and a visionary and what the difference is. So it's, it's been game changing to even know what that is. Okay. So mm -hmm. I suggest everyone check out uh, Rocket Fuel and Mark Winter's work as well. Um, before I introduce, introduce you to today's guest, who has been a pioneer in many different things, and you'll see what I mean in a second. Um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And what we do is we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. Um, it could be partners, it could be strategic partners, it could be anyone. And basically we do that because we help you run your podcast. Okay. And the number one thing for me, Dan, in my life is relationships. So I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships. And over since 2008, the best way for me has been featuring and profiling amazing people like you on my podcast and sharing with the world what you do. And so if you are a company, you thought about starting a podcast, first of all, you should. Second of all, if you have questions, you can email us. Go to rise25.com, support at rise25media.com. Uh, today's guest, I'm super excited to introduce you. Justin Breen is the person who's ah. like, you need to have Dan Zawacki on. Justin Breen, you can go to his site, brepicllc.com. He basically creates life, uh, your top connections for visionaries and entrepreneurs. Okay, so check it out. In 1987, let's, we're rewind 1987, Dan, for a second. Oh, the <laughs> yeah, the Wayback Machine. He founded a company called Lobstergram. Um, it's exactly what it sounds like, by the way. He delivered live lobsters and seafood around the country as gifts. And he was the first person in the world to do this. And he created a new market. And he was featured in Forbes, Wall Street Journal. He was on Oprah and 500 other media outlets. And after three decades of running Lobstergram, he sold it. And now he runs fourmores.com. That's the number four, and then M O R E S.com, where he helps your organization implement EOS. And the four mores are more structure, more growth, more profit, more fun. And Dan's going to talk all about the journey and about that. So, Dan, thanks for joining me. Oh my gosh, thanks for having me on. That's, the, that's an awesome uh, introduction. It's all true, <laughs> it's even better behind the scenes. You know, what's, what's cool, um, Dan, is the original idea, um, you live in Peoria and you call yourself self an accidental entrepreneur, okay? So what was the original idea behind Lobstergram? Well, being an accident, accidental entrepreneur, uh, I, some people have these great business plans and all this, not me. Not saying it, you shouldn't, but I work for Honeywell. And I sold computers that were as big as my desk that ran commercial buildings. I'm not even kidding. There's more power in my cell phone than in these computers. And so it would turn on and off the lights and the HVAC and heating and all that kind of stuff. And just out of school and I did it. And boy, it was a lot of fun. And I found out I was really, really pretty darn good at selling it. And the problem was that all my contracts came up in January. So I took all my clients out for dinners and then it turned into lunches. And this is back in like 85, 86. And back then, no one went out and drank iced tea. I mean, <laughs> everybody, Jack and Cokes, and it was a party. 
Uh, but good thing my liver was, uh, you know, like 23 years old. <laughs> so it was okay. And, but it literally was my whole November and December was just going out, going out, taking out clients. Cause the more clients I got, the more I went out. So I said, I need a great gift. I'm thinking, I'm like, ah, uh, maybe Omaha Steaks. I'm like, ah, eh, everybody gets Omaha Steaks. Great company though. Uh, and I said, eh, Harry and David. And I'm thinking, yeah, I work with a lot of these engineers. I'm going to go up and go, hey, here's this nice pair for you. <laughs> <laughs> it probably like just belt me. And so I was one of those kids that I always loved lobster. Okay. When I would go around with my parents, I would always order lobster and they'd say, no, he's getting the cheeseburger. But every once in a while, I'd get a lobster. And so I started thinking, gosh, they're fun. It's unique and it's memorable. And by golly, I'm going to find somebody that can ship lobsters out for me. So I tried and I tried and I called my friend up in Boston and he sent me the yellow pages and I called up all the lobster guys out there and they all said the same thing. That's stupid. That's the dumbest idea. If it was a good idea, someone would be doing it. And I'm like, gosh, they're probably right. But anyways, can you at least send me, you know, a couple hundred lobsters and then I will figure a way to deliver them. And they're like, yeah, we could do that. Cause you know, they would send them to a lot of um, restaurants. So that's what they did. And so I literally, I didn't know anything about lobsters except I liked them. So in the company car, I put a blue tarp in there and I drove to the airport and I put all the lobsters and there's 180 lobsters crawling around in my back of my car, just all over. I, my packaging was horrible. It was a jewel bag. And then I bought a couple cases of lemons, a couple cases of butter, and a big bag of bows. So I open up the trunk, I put two lobsters in there, a stick of butter, <laughs> a lemon, and I'd staple a, a bow on there and write a little gift card saying, hey, thanks for your business. It was fun golfing with you or fun doing this or whatever. And I drove around for two and a half days and it was like playing uh, Santa Claus with lobsters. You hand delivered them. Hand delivered them. People didn't know it. And it was fun. The pe people's faces were just priceless. I just, no appointments, walk in, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Open it up and they go, ah, are these live? I'd be like, they are. See you later. Got to go. Because, you know, I, I had like 60 clients. I had to go deliver all these things. So I, I was on a roll. And um, one of the clients worked for the Department of Corrections. He's like, Dan, I saw him like a month later. He goes, Dan, you going to do anything with this lobster thing? And I said, uh, and he goes, well, if you're not, he goes, my wife wants to. And I go, well, well, yeah, I've been working on a business plan. Uh, and I hadn't done nothing about it. But I'm like, here's this guy. He's like a mentor to me. If he thinks it's a good idea, well, by golly, I should at least think about this. So that night, this is the craziest thing. I go to my little studio apartment, which is just little things, sit at my round table, and I start putting together a to-do list which was, I still have it too, it's pretty cool. And number one is get lobsters. Uh, number two, get name, make a name. Number three, it's so funny, how do credit cards work? You know, how do you, how does someone give you these numbers over the phone and magically it goes into your bank account? I mean, that's how naive of a business person I was. Well, I mean, at the time, you know, there's no internet. No, no internet. So, like now people are like, oh, you just get a credit card. You send them a straight payment or something. Or pay. No, that, that doesn't exist at the time. No. I mean, it was crazy. And then, you know, just coming up with a name and an 800 number. It was number. actually illegal, Dan. So I interviewed Joe Sugarman, uh, who started Blue Blocker Sunglasses. And he came up with the 1-800 number. Before he came up with it, it was illegal to take credit cards over the phone. Oh, so it's not like that was, I don't think it's dumb at all, right? Yeah. That well, 
at the time it just seemed like I now when it's like duh right but it was I think it was it was just a list page of things to do and so at night instead of going out to the bars you know I would try and work on these things and then check it off finally I'm done I got them all checked off I'm like holy crap this is I think I have a company and uh, that's that's how it started what was it, Dan the shipping evolution so obviously it goes from jewel trunk and tarp <laughs> and jewel bag to later on when it, the business was mature how are you shipping them out all right so there's in between there's a pretty crazy okay. thing so i didn't know how to do it okay so that was number one so my first one is i took a cardboard box and i put a big five pound block of dry ice in there and I put two live lobsters in there, wrapped it up, taped it real good, sent it to my buddy down in Florida. He gets it the next day because he had to ship it next day. I'm all excited. I'm like, oh my gosh, how are they? You know, what happened? And he goes, uh, I go, what happened? And he's like, well, they're not alive. And he goes, and it looks like they kind of blew up. They're like pieces all over. I go, what? <laughs> so it turned out that of course, uh, dry ice, carbon dioxide, sublimes, you know, turns into a gas when it melts. And so it asphyxiated the lobsters probably within 60 seconds if I closed the box. So that was one issue. Next, dry ice is like 100 and some degrees below zero. So it actually froze them solid. And so as FedEx was tossing them around, they just like shattered. So that was not the way to do it. And so I just kept playing around with doing it. And, and finally, I, I uh, used a, a, a styrofoam cooler. I think I got at Walgreens, put it in a box, put blue ice in there. And I got some uh, seaweed from a lobster guy. And that worked. So they, and, they, eat this, they eat it as they're going or to stay alive? Or what's with the, uh, they what's do, with the but seaweed? The seaweed is more for insulation. Oh. You know, so it doesn't get smushed, and it keeps them moist because they, their, their, their gills or lungs of lobsters are like forty percent efficient uh, in the air, so they'll live for a while out. So that's mm. why we had to send them next day delivery, and um, so that that's how we did it. And and then uh, the FDA found out about it, and they. That's another story. <laughs> um, there, there's a couple of turning points that I see in your story that I thought were pretty cool. And, and I'm going to give full credit to your business for your sister. No, I'm just kidding. Your sister <laughs> told you to get on radio. Yes. It seems can. like that was huge for you. That was the turning point of the company. So all you brothers out there, listen to your sisters. But so I am there okay it's about three months and i've sold i call them mercy mercy sales right that's like your friends of course your mom and dad your uncle people that just feel sorry listen for you. If, if the internet was around dan at that time the th it would have blown up i mean just the word of mouth of something like that it would it blow up but anyways crazy yeah, but yeah, keep going yeah. no internet al gore didn't think of it yet <laughs> but uh <laughs> so the, you know, my sister, she calls me up and I'm almost in tears because literally I've told everybody, hey, I'm an entrepreneur now, right? I've got a company. I haven't sold really anything. And so literally, I mean, I remember talking to her to this day. This is 33, 34 years later. And she's like, well, why don't you try and get on the radio? You know, uh, Jonathan Brandmeier. It was like the top guy in Chicago, almost the country, and just call him and, you know, see what he has to say. So, first of all, Johnny B was my hero, and I listened to him all the time uh, when I was living in Chicago. So, it was very nerve-wracking to talk to your hero. So, I practiced literally in front of the mirror for a week of what I would say, and then what he would say, and then he'd say this, and I would say this. And so I finally get the guts to call Johnny B. So I talk to the receptionist, and the receptionist is like, yeah, Mr. Brandmeier's in. 
I'll send you right through. All of a sudden, everything I found is blown away. <laughs> I thought, I'm going to have to go through like two, three people to get to him. Picks up the phone, and I just go, my name is Dan Zwicky. I got this company in Peoria, Illinois. We ship my lovers off. And I'm just talking like a mile a minute. And he goes, whoa, whoa, what? He goes, talk slower. So I told him, I said, hey, I'm, I'm shipping my lobsters. I ship around the country. And he goes, you do what? I go, I am shipping live lobsters around the country. And he goes, and where? And I go, Peoria, you know, Illinois. And he goes, Peoria? Why not Maine? I go, I live in Peoria. He goes, can you come up next week? <laughs> I go, sure. So he invited me on a show. And he goes, but. And I'm like, ah, there's the but. He goes, you got to give away three lobster grams to my listeners. I'm like, wow, I would have gave away 30. And so I'm like, okay. And so uh, I basically told uh, the little checkout board that it was going to be on a Friday I was going to be on, that I was going to make cold calls in Springfield, Illinois on Friday. And uh, instead, I, uh, I couldn't lie to my boss's face, but I could lie to the checkout board. And then I went on up to Chicago and got on the air for... It was 12 minutes, which was unheard of. And um, at that time, he, his hour or his per minute rate on the radio was $1,800. Wow. So it was amazing. And it's a blur. I don't even remember it. I remember being there, but it was like just crazy because I had never been on the radio before or anything like that. I just remember... I wore a suit jacket and I was pitting out from my t-shirt to my shirt to my suit jacket. I was so, I was a wreck and sold over 180 packages. That wow. In that. So I was like, okay, well, I guess this crazy idea is going to work. What at the time, what was it priced and what did people get like for a package at the time? So I totally underpriced it, but you know, pricing is one of the hardest things to do, especially with a new product, new market, new idea. So on that $99, including delivery, next day delivery, you got two lobsters. Oh, I sound like I'm on the radio through the commercial. <laughs> <laughs> two live lobsters guaranteed to arrive live. Lemon, butter, shell crackers, bibs. I even put the 12 quart enamel uh, and steel cooking pot in there, a uh, long stem candle, glass candle holder, wow. and matches, because no one had matches, no one really was smoking back then, and cooking instructions. And uh, $99, that's a steal. It was a steal. I totally underpriced it, because I didn't really know how to price anything. Uh, but I learned, you know, and, uh, but I did that for a couple of years and then finally I had to add shipping onto it. And then shipping's made, expensive. That's heavy. All that stuff that you're sending. Uh, it was a 14 pound package and, um, next day delivery, which is most expensive. So, uh, I think I added like $29 onto it. So it was like 129 at that time, but nobody was doing free delivery. I was like, the first person to do free delivery back then. It just seemed like the right thing to do. So Jeff Bezos out there, he says he takes credit. I do. <laughs> That's Jeff Bezos is like, I learned free delivery from that lobster gram I received in 1989. He probably got one. I had so many people that were famous got lobster grams. It was, it was crazy. So the, um, the radio, you then doubled down on radio after that. Yeah. So, might not be the brightest guy in the world, but hey, I figured out it works it worked there. It's going to work somewhere else. So, I called up the uh, Steve Dahl and Gary Meyer show, and very popular show. Basically used the same lines, and they were like, hey, come on the studio. And I just kept doing that until I ran out of personalities. And uh, then by that time, I actually had enough uh, money where I had a budget and I could spend some money on radio, but I also learned the importance of live reads. And, uh, and I also learned what a target market was. 
And that was literally uh, the biggest bang for the buck, which turned out was conservative talk show hosts who do live reads. Talk to me about the live read part. What did you discover? I discovered that if they love lobsters, which they most, all of them did, uh, you know, you paid for a 60 second spot, it might go 90 seconds, might go two minutes. And uh, part of what I learned, and I think is important for everybody listening, is that I made the personal con connection with everybody. So before I would even think of letting them do a live read, I made sure that I, A, could meet them face to face, and I would bring a lobster gram with me, the live lobsters, the whole setup, and I would give it to them and let them try it so that they would get it. But the biggest thing I learned kind of accidentally was that they realized I wasn't a faceless agency, that I was a real person starting out. And what I found out is that they really wanted to help. Um, and so, you know, that I did that in Chicago. And I remember thinking to myself, gosh, if this works in Chicago, I wonder if it could work in New York. And I remember just going through my head, just complete head trash. Maybe this is just a fluke in New, you know, in Chicago. So I went out to New York and I got a meeting with Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh and did the same thing, brought him lobster grams, just told him the story, exactly what I said about, you know, doing them out of my car and, and this. And they loved it. And uh, they all were like, yeah, we're gonna do a great job for you but you have to let us give away lobster grams to our listeners. And we're not gonna charge any extra for it. Just let us give them away and we'll give you free plugs. And uh, it turned out I was actually Sean Hannity's first national advertiser. And I think he has 500 out there now, but he was doing overnights back then. But we just hit it off and I just knew that guy was in, in for greatness. Um, and I remember him telling me, he goes, Danny goes, look, I'm just doing overnights right now. He goes, but I'm working on this syndicated deal. And he goes, but nobody wants to be the first one. He, and he's talking like Chevy, you know, Coke and all these freaking monster companies. He goes, they don't want to be the first one. And he goes, would you be the first one? And he goes, if it works, he goes, I will just plug the hell out of you forever. And he goes, I and mean, if it doesn't work, he goes, I'll plug the hell out of you in New York only. And so I remember thinking, all right. And uh, that was that was my gold. When you talk about nuggets and that, that was the gold. And then I just duplicated that around the country in all the major markets. Well, I love what you said too, Dan, about you would also sometimes barter for that. So I mean, the, the first one, you basically got $20,000 worth of advertising at the time for free, right? But um, you then, it seemed like you knew that and you did it consciously. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So pay for a 60 second spot, give away a couple lobster grams, you know, maybe they cost me 70 bucks and it would turn into, you know, hey, we're gonna give a lobster gram out if you can answer this question or this question. And then it is, you know, the two lives literally like a 45 second spot for 70 bucks. Um, but bartering, um, you know, so many people I talk to, so many new entrepreneurs, I tell them, think about bartering. If you got something cool that people want, you know, barter, right? Because cash is the hardest thing to do when you're starting. I mean, I literally started with a thousand bucks. You know, so I hear people always say, oh, I don't have any money. I go, I didn't either. But people like lobsters. I actually bartered, this is crazy, a brand new Lexus with a dealership in Chicago. Wow. I bartered lob, uh, gift <laughs> certificates. $50,000 of gift certificates I bartered. And what they did is they would give out 500, every time someone would buy a brand new Lexus, they would give them a $500 lobster gram gift certificate and as a thank you for being a, a customer. And boy, they got a ton of, of great publicity out of that. 
I love that. So you got a car and you got a potential new customer who yeah. is a great qualified customer because they just bought a Lexus. It, yeah, right? I got a ton of clients out of that because they got them. It's genius. They, they loved it and they would send them out as gifts to their friends who are all, you know, pretty big shooters. You know, back in the 90s, a 50,000 Lexus, 50,000 dollar Lexus is like 75 right now. So how did you think about that? Dan, did you go and pitch them and they're like, hey, old barter, how did you think about doing that? <laughs> so the older I got, the more I said, just ask, right? If you don't ask, no one's going to read your mind. And so I remember I wanted a Lexus. I was tired of driving around my little Chevy used pickup trucks and I wanted to get a Lexus. And so I decided I was just going to drive right to the Lexus dealer and the name on the, the sign, you know, I was going to ask for that guy. And I did. He came out. I told him who it was. He had heard about lobster gram. So I was like, Oh, okay. That's a good start. And I said, uh, I really want to get a Lexus. And I told him, I said, and I think that, you know, we could barter for it and it would be great because I know your car doesn't cost you that much doesn't cost a 50. So you'll get it. You'll get the gift certificates. You're going to make all your people happy. And this was like in October and Christmas is coming up. And so you can give everyone a great gift and you'll get all this great PR out of it. And you know what? You could probably even mention it in your radio commercials. If you buy a, a Lexus now, you'll get a free $500 lobster gram gift certificate, which they ended up doing too. Genius. And so it worked. I was, I walked out of there going, Oh my gosh, how did, what just happened? And, uh, I literally left with a new Lexus. Wow. After, yeah. So that was pretty cool. I could have just seen you, um, going up. I'm just going through the whole process as a normal customer. And at the end, well, how are you going to pay for this, sir? And you just open a briefcase full of these gift certificates. <laughs> Good thing you told them on the front end and not waited to the, to the end. Well, the funny thing is, it was all done in a handshake, and uh, he said, well, just give me the gift certificates within a week. And so wow. I, brought, I brought, brought back, you know, all these $50,000 gift certificates in the trunk of my new Lexus, and it was, it was great. Amazing. Yeah. With, you know, I mentioned Oprah and Howard Stern. I don't know if either of those are interesting stories or both. Yeah. Um, so Oprah, we were, um, I never actually met her, but I got to meet her people. And um, they were doing a story for her magazine, her favorite things. And she had received a lobster gram from, I never really figured out who it was, but from some, one of her friends and just fell in love with it, loved it. So she had one of her producers call me up. I remember I'm sitting at the office, the Lobstergram World Headquarters. And this person calls up and says they're from Oprah. And, you know, this is like 95-ish, 7-ish, whatever. She was like the top, the queen of all the queens of everything. And so there, this person's on the phone saying, yeah, uh, I'm one of Oprah's producers and we'd like to, you know, do a story on Lobstergram, put it in one of her favorite things. And we're actually thinking of devoting a full page to it. I'm thinking, all right, which one of my a-hole friends is this? <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. And I actually said that. And he goes, no, 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 you misunderstand. And I'm all of a sudden, I go, oh my gosh, I think I just ruined this. And so I go, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And she goes, no, we really want to do it. And so they ended up doing it, and it was a full page. Wow. It looked like an ad. I mean, it's, it was unbelievable. And we sold the tales from around the world was the package. So there were seven different ty types of tales from all over the country, or excuse me, the world. And each one tasted different, or each one looked different. It was really beautiful. Wow. They did a great job of styling it, but uh, with Howard was was interesting because you know I, I go to meet Howard uh, first. I sit in the the studio off you know and just watching the craziness that's going on. And he is on air. He is just 
crazy. I don't know. He's just got so much energy. So I'm like ready for this guy that's just, you know, whoop, 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 you know. And he comes out. And I go to shake his hand. And he does one of those and does a fist bump. <laughs> so now this is normal, right? But back then, you know, someone doesn't shake your hand. You're just like, oh, my gosh, what did I do, right? Well, he was one of those, you know, germaphobe guys, right? Uh, it's and, good for during COVID. Yeah, good now. It's like he was a pioneer. as He's been a pioneer in everything. And so I'm kind of just like at a loss. And he goes, all right, tell me what you do. And so, and he's tall. I forget. He's like 6'4 or something. And I'm like 5'8". So I'm like this, talking to him the whole time. And he is really introverted. I mean, he was very, almost shy. So I'm telling him about Lobstergram, what I'm doing. And uh, he goes, all right. He goes, you got about 60 more seconds. And so I've been talking, I don't know, for maybe two minutes. And all of a sudden, I'm like, uh, okay. And so I hurry up and cram it all in there. And he goes, okay, we'll do a great job for you. Thanks. And he walks, turns around, and poof, gone. Like, wow. And then Baba Booey, Gary, he looks at me. He goes, wow. He goes, you've gotten more time than the executives of Coca-Cola ever have. Wow. He goes, this is going to be great. And he goes, and I'll make sure. He goes, make sure you send one to me as well. Uh, and I'll make sure when he ever brings it up. And he goes, you know what? You should send one to Robin too. And they literally became great clients, Robin and Baba Bowie. So that was that was just one of those, not very conservative, but <laughs> <laughs> but he was just one of those guys, you know, just great at doing live reads, and uh, just loved the product too. And again, I think just by meeting him and him realizing that I came all the way from Chicago, because I was still in Chicago at the time, you know, that it was really meant something. It wasn't this faceless agency that most people, you know, yeah. they deal with. Another, and that's amazing. Thanks for sharing that. That's, that's, you know, Dan, another turning point, it seemed to be when you had your own warehouse and you were experiencing some, some um, pieces that from the different suppliers. So, I, my first warehouse, quote unquote, was my two car garage. Well, actually, the first one. Your trunk. Florida. Yeah, the trunk. <laughs> At the time, I was in my office, was in the old county morgue building in Peoria, Illinois, which was built in uh, 1854. And my warehouse. The morgue building. Yeah. The morgue. I guess it's, it's fitting that you are sending live things. In the morgue. Yeah. But when this, this is 1850s, you know, low ceilings, my packing table, literally, this is so morbid, was the old embalming tables was what I used to, you know, uh, assemble the packages together. Um, oh, it's gross. <laughs> and it was haunted. I don't know if you believe in ghosts or anything like that, but the weirdest things would happen in that place. Uh, but my, my original warehouse then was my garage in Chicago. It was a two-car garage and um, that worked out pretty good and then I actually built by scratch a warehouse in Maine because I was I figured hey I got to go to Maine right people don't want their lobsters from Chicago anymore they want it from Maine so I bought a warehouse in Maine and I remember trying to find something that could help me design it people are just like what there's no such thing right so how I designed it, it was a big open space I got about 10 rolls of duct tape and I literally just put like, here's the freezer and I tape it out. I go, okay, here's where the, the trucks come in to load the pots in, to load the coolers. So then I would draw an arrow on it, you know, as the flow. Here's where the lobster tank is because this is where the lobsters need to be assembled. And it was the craziest thing. And I remember talking to a contractor uh, you know, to build this all. And he's like, yeah, do you have plans? I go, oh yeah. So he comes over and he goes, where's the plans? I point to the ground. I go right here. And he's like, those aren't plans. I go, yeah, but this is my vision. This is, where's this is where I want the freezer to go. This is why this and this. And he just started cracking up, but he ended up drawing the plans 
we hired an architect and uh, it worked out and I had that for 15 years. And that was because um, you had suppliers that weren't as, you know, they weren't as excited about the business. Was that? Well, yeah. So before then I had some suppliers that were uh, in Massachusetts and they did a good job. I would say not a great job you know, the quality control. So a lot of times there's what we call uh, weak lobsters, right? They're just not as strong. And so they would, you know, you got a thousand lobsters. There's going to be a couple that aren't just strong enough. So they wouldn't really check out the quality and that, and they'd put them in there. And guess what? People would get them and they would be DOAs, right? And my guarantee was 100% happiness. That was it. So if it was a dead lobster, that wasn't 100% happiness. And so I would have to refund their money or ship another package out, right? And so it just wasn't working. Of course, you know, if somebody would at four o'clock in the afternoon, they say, oh, I got to send a lobster grand to my dad. His birthday's tomorrow. Can you get it out, right? We'd get on the phone with our uh, fulfillment center. It would be like, oh, yeah, just one more, just one more. And they'd be like, no, everybody's gone. We can't do it. And after a year of that, I was like, yeah, that's not going to work. I need my own people. And of course, having your own staff has its own set of issues as it is, but it's, it worked out, you know, we eventually we had 128 people at, around the holidays and that became more of a job than, than a company, I guess. I want to talk about, um, EOS and what you do now, but talk about the transition, the thought, you know, between selling and then, yeah. you know, actually running for Moore's. So it was about, let's see, I sold in seven, 2017. So about 2015, I was becoming disillusioned. I think is a good word. And you talked about the vin uh, visionary and integrator. Okay. I had no idea. Right. I am a total visionary, obviously, starting a lobster company in Chicago, right? So I got to the point, probably when we hit about 10-ish million in sales, where I was forced to become the manager slash the integrator, you know, making sales, marketing, operations, HR, IT, all the crap work together. And I hated it. Right, I hated it. I wanted to go kiss babies, shake hands with suppliers, close big deals, make new packages, you know, go source new products around the world. Stuff that was the good stuff, not managing people. Uh, I hated that, and so I got I just literally wanted to sell my company. And so I read the book, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I need an integrator, which was in those days a president. I need a president. So I found a president, great guy, still friends. He did a, a great amount of work there, really put the company back, uh, grew quicker. Um, but um, three years later, you know, after doing it for 27 years, I just literally was burned out. We did 50% of our sales in November, December. I hated Christmas. Matter of fact, I hate, literally, I hated Christmas. It was so, my birthday is October 30th. So on Halloween, that's, I started hating life because that's when we started to plan everything. And it was getting to be literally not a great life. And it was sad. And I felt my family was getting older and, and I'm gone. So that's when uh, I decided to sell the company. And I got into a few issues with my bank. Who doesn't? <laughs> Basically, I bought too much inventory and I had leftover inventory and the bank was kind of like, well, you know, pony up some big bucks or, you know, figure something else out. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to sell it. And so I did. And I knew, though, that I was going to do, I had a lot to give, right? I wanted to, to do EOS. And I wanted to teach people the 33 years of being in the trenches, uh, all the good, the bad, and the ugly, but have a system, right? Because EOS, Entrepreneur Operating 
system is I wish I would have had that. Oh my gosh, if I would have had that, it would have been a, such a easier, better life, right? EOS is all about living a better life. And I get such great satisfaction working with my clients. Um, and matter of fact, all my clients are friends and I love working with them. And, you know, finding your second passion in life, finding your first passion in life, I mean, how many people do, you know, you interview the people that do, but think about the other 95%. Well, a lot of times the people they do, it wasn't their first iteration. It may have been their like 11th stab at something, right? Of just figuring out what they do like. Yeah, that, that could, yeah, that, I just, like I said, accidental, boom, first company, first time I even tried to start a company, uh, who knew it would work? Um, but I always wanted to be a teacher and what gets me up in the morning now is helping out my clients and I love it. I am so happy that I'm, you know, able to do this kind of important work. Let's talk about, um, there's a company that buys and sells homes. Yeah. What, how did they present to you and then talk about what you do with them? So when we first met, it was just four people and they had the, this was last December I worked with them and they realized they just didn't have the right structure. And EOS is literally building the right structure, the roles. We call it the accountability chart. Some people call it an organizational chart. It's different, but just kind of similar. And uh, they were real serious guys. So, but fun guys, right? They're still fun. And so um, we literally did a pivot. And this year, I am so proud of these guys, and I'm not taking any of the credit because they did all the work, but they're going to they're gonna make almost $900,000. So we went from losing to gaining that. Two guys, they've hired a bunch of people. Uh, they know their focus, they have their core values, you know, they're, they're following the process, they're working really hard. And they're, and they're having more free time than they ever did before. And uh, it's just great to see that. I mean, I'm one of those people where I think, you know, the pie is only this big. When my clients can grow, that's what I want to see. That's what makes me get up in the morning. What was a big piece of advice for them? Basically, get a structure and quit getting in front of each other and do it, duplicating stuff. And that your present business model is literally not working because you're not making any money. And we literally spent uh, four hours, we call it IDSing. I don't know if Gino talked about it, but it's identifying, discussing, and solving. So we spent four hours figuring out what a pivot would be. And uh, we did it and, it, and it worked. They really put the time and the effort into doing it. But really building that structure and the core focus stay in this silo and let's just do this don't go out don't grab the shiny things right right it's so tough sometimes to, oh my god i used to do it a lot scram all the time it was one of my weaknesses but that's what i tell my clients now i said that was one of the reasons you know i mean we got to 15 in million in sales but i probably could have got there a lot quicker if i would have focused more on it not the shiny things and then there was an hvac company yeah, still my client. Love those guys. Great company. Been around for 60 years. Huh. And again, uh, one of the things, been working with them for about a year and a half, um, is the structure. So we, you can see behind me is a whiteboard because I draw everything out. Because if you can't draw it out, it's probably a bunch of BS, is my opinion, right? Totally. So we draw out the accountability chart. Literally one of the first things I do when I meet with a, a client. And so when we started building out the structure, literally, and I'm not exaggerating, for the first hour, the board was completely blank because no, everybody was running over everybody. Nobody had defined roles. Everybody was doing a little this, a little that, a little that, a little this. 
What was happening, nobody was doing anything great. But they still had monster sales um, in their space. So what, what we did, it, it took literally four months to get a great accountability chart because it was a total pivot from where, you know, 150 people in there uh, that were working there, uh, everybody was kind of just running all over the place. So we literally, that was it, building a structure and coming up with core values that literally were at the, the heart and soul of their people and making sure we had the right people, Jim Collins, right? Good to great, right people, right seats. So there was a lot of that. And, and to me, that's one of the hardest things I think for my clients to do is, you know, you have people that have been there a long time but they just don't have your core values or they're just not doing, they're not in the right seat. And that's a hard, hard call to make really a hard call to make. Dan, how'd you come up with four mores? <laughs> I love this. Uh, so one day I'm on the whiteboard and uh, I'm telling people, uh, I go, we need to build the structure. Right, because people go, no, we have the vision first. Go, no, structure first, vision second. So I write on there, structure, okay? And I go, and if we have the right structure, we're gonna grow. So I put on there, growth. And then I go, and if we grow, because we have the right structure, we're gonna grow profitably. And I wrote on there, profit. And if you grow, and if you have structure and the profit, you're gonna have fun, and I wrote fun. And I said, because if you can't have fun, you might as well get a real job. And then somebody looked at it and they go, oh, that's the four mores. And I go, and I wrote on top, I go, the four mores. And then we went to lunch and I went to GoDaddy and I bought fourmores.com for like 11 bucks. And then I bought the four mores, the four mores group. I bought all the iterations of it. And because my company used to be called the Traction Vision Group. So you can imagine telling somebody, Dan at Traction Vision Group. It's like 26 characters. And then all of a sudden you come up with, oh, it's Dan at Four Mores and use the number four. People are like, oh. So it just, so now actually when I, I talk to my clients, they'll be like, yeah, I want some of that four mores, Dan. <laughs> so it's, uh, I'm actually trade, I trademarked it too. So that's pretty cool. And first of all, I have, I have one last question. It's a loaded question. Oh, boy. And it has to do with the 25 things in 33 years. So it's actually more than one question. It's, it's one question that is, uh, will unlock magic. But before we talk about that, Dan, I want to point people to your website. And um, people can go to four, the number four, like you said, mores.com. And um, I guess, how can people best engage with you? Who are ideal clients for you? Oh, so ideal clients for me are entrepreneurial, okay? And the next question I ask people, I say, do you want to grow? And if people say, no, I'm pretty happy where they're at, I go, save your money, do what you're doing, right? So entrepreneurial, they need to grow. And it could be anywhere from, like I said, I did a, I had a startup that I worked with to an $80 million company that I work with. So it's anywhere in between, but it's people that literally want to liter live a better life. You know, that their business has maybe taken over their life. That happened to me. You know, they don't have the right people. What do you do? And that happened to me. You know, there's no accountability, right? That happened to me. I didn't. I have. I just would tell people one thing here, and I expect them to listen. Of course, that never happened. The visionary in me. <laughs> Fourmores.com. Check it out. Check out. You know, there's some great information there. Um, so, Dan, last question is: You have these 25 things in 33 yeah. years that you have discovered from being in the trenches. Um, so I'm wondering if you could share some of those. All right, I'll share a couple of the good, well, they're all good, but. You, you could share all of them if you want. I don't know how long each of them are. Yeah, but. well, each one's a sentence, so it, you know, it'll be a while, but. <laughs> I should put these on my website, actually. Maybe I'll do that. Thanks, That's Jerry. what we're gonna do. 
All right. So I want to say, is this uh, is this printed out right now, or is it did you is it handwritten? Oh no, I'm big times now. Okay, oh, cool. Traction vision. I want the handwritten version. Oh, I think I threw that out actually. But I guess one of the biggest ones that I is don't overthink your plan. Right? Make it short and concise and a couple pages. If you can't get your idea in a couple pages, then it's probably a bunch of BS. I mean, you know, they got these software programs out there and they're all loaded. It's all cut and paste. And guess what? I have a ton of friends that are bankers and own PE firms. They can smell that right away. And they just like, they want to see, you know, have a few grammatical errors in there. They don't want it to be all perfect and pretty. Um, have a great story to tell. Every single entrepreneur that I ever met, and I'll ask you this question too, they all have a great story. Some of them just don't know it or they don't get it out. But the ones that have really done a great job, they get, they get it out. And I think my favorite one is expect victory. And, then, and I have, and I'm just gonna say, when the shit hits the fan, you just gotta overcome it, right? Expect victory, I love that. And don't listen to the pessimists. They're all out there. Most of them are gonna be jealous of you. And just stay away from them like the plague. And every employee should be responsible for some measurable of what brings success to the business. I don't care if you're uh, like one of my clients, they have a full-time janitor. His measure is once a week, he's got to make sure that that manufacturing and all the office floors and everything are completely clean and you can eat off that dang floor. And he's great at his job and he can do it better anybody else. And I'll just tell you one thing, keep your debt low. I got sucked into a $3 million debt and I'll tell you what, you don't sleep too good. <laughs> and there's some other good ones. Let's end on a positive one, I suppose, you not being able to sleep at night. <laughs> I got a great one. Yeah. Be nice to everyone and be an optimist. That's gonna go to sleep. And you never know the next person you're talking to, oh my gosh, you, you, you know, just because they dress grungy, just because maybe they drive a beat up car or whatever, they might be a multi, multi millionaire that wants to buy your company or at least be your friend, be a friend, right? And I think that's one of the biggest things that I've learned over the years. Be nice and be an optimist because if you're a pessimist, don't try and start a company. <laughs> Our friend Justin Breen would echo those words and says that a lot about being an optimist. So Dan, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out fourmores.com. Check out more and check out more episodes. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. It's been awesome. You're a great interviewer. Thanks, Dan. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. Right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.